Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And I'm glad that it's a small audience because, you know, I'm kind of a bit of a nervous wreck this afternoon. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll launch into it. This is my virtual speech. Um, so I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight. Um, I want to keep it really casual, the same as usual. But what I've done is I've, I've kind of gone back through all of my old photos, you know, from when I first started my career. Because That's a look. This, Very good. Yeah, well, there's just yeah, been this great. recurring theme there, you see. And um, it, it's kind of interesting because growing up as a young girl, you know, I was born in Australia and um, I was actually one of those really shy, quiet girls that you, you couldn't get boo out of. And um, people kind of never believe me when I tell them that, but I, I never really had any friends and I was really a, a major bookworm and um, I used to get bullied a lot and I used to hide in the library as a young girl right up until I, I started high school. Um, so, you know, for me to actually then turn around many years later and I remember going to the school counsellor when I turned 15 and I said to him, I'm leaving school the day I turn 16 because I'm legally allowed to. And he's like, oh, OK. And he said, well, if you do that now, you'll never make anything of yourself in the future. And I went, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> so um, I originally left school and um, I grew up in a town that um, was like a wee surfy town. It was called Foster. And everyone always kind of remembers that because it, it, it it's named it's kind of named after Foster's the beer, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a small surfy town, and um, there was really very little to do there other than, than go to the beach. So when I left school um, at the age of sixteen, as I said, I was going to um, the day of my birthday. I also moved out of home. And I had all my bags packed, ready to go, and I moved in my, with my boyfriend at the time. And um, I kind of bummed around as you do for the first three months because when I left school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I had never really experienced anything outside of, you know, my small town and my small family. So um, luckily a friend of mine, his mum was doing a secretarial course and she kind of, you know, she, was, she said it was bookkeeping and typing and said it was really interesting. So, you know, for the first time I kind of went, well, actually, I, I really like the sound of that. I think I'll give it a go. And um, I left school with, you know, terrible results and everything. And, um, you know, because I got bullied a lot and I used to hide in the toilets and stuff at lunch times, And I had really terrible grades for, you know, years and years and years. And one of the only things I really excelled in was kind of English and and I was on the debating team at the school and you know I really enjoyed all that so once I kind of got into the secretarial course I kind of realized that that was the kind of path that I wanted to follow for the rest of my life you know I really loved working with you know figures and I really liked, you know, the the typing and, you know, I learned to type one of those really old manual typewriters where you have to push the buttons down and your fingers go in between them. So, you know, I really did start at the very beginning and, you know, we used to have to wear those big old fashioned bibs back then, you know, so you couldn't see the keys in front of you. Um, so, you know, it just shows you how far back I kind of go with things and I... Um, once I kind of done that, I went and did a full time and then um, I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my career. And uh, I was very lucky at the time that um, a position came up and I'll kind of, sh I'll share you, <laughs> I'll share my screen with you. Um, I was really lucky that a position came up in the local tourist centre. So I've just pulled together like a wee bit, you know, a, a couple of, um, photos to show you kind of where I come from and the background I mean obviously everyone thinks Australia is completely gorgeous and it definitely is that and I mean I was really lucky to grow up in a small town you know looking back now um, because you know we were always surrounded by these beautiful beaches and beautiful oceans and you know you could often go down and spend a whole day there just on your own and you know we had like 16 beaches in our local area um, and the town where I grew up, I mean, you go out along the break wall and you'd see dolphins jumping in the water all the time. You know, it was just really, really stunning. So it's hard for me to go back and look at photos of Australia because this is my local beach. 
you know, and the sand is just pure white there. And, you know, I'd often go down over night time. And um, once I moved out of home, you know, when I turned 16, I got a little one bedroom flat and I actually lived on my own there with my cat. And I used to take her down here on a leash for walks with me, you know, and I, um, it was just a wonderful kind of life, but you know, you can only do that for so long. And um, after a while doing that, I was really bored and I wanted to do something with my life. And luckily the local tourist center, they had a job going and um, I applied for that. And luckily um, what I did is I, I, because I didn't have any experience in an office situation, what I did is I actually went in and I actually volunteered to work for them for free from the very beginning. And I started there on a Saturday morning um, and it was an unpaid job, but I actually really loved it. And I just did it purely to get the experience. And that was really kind of the start of my entire career because I realized I had a real flair for tourism and events and going out and speaking to people in their everyday lives. And I really enjoyed actually people coming into the center and speaking to me about where they wanted to go. And part of my job was actually going out and visiting all these amazing, you know, tourist attractions and going and reviewing them and then writing reviews and articles and editorial and things. Um, and I really loved all of that. So um, once I actually finished my education at the college, the principal actually came to me and we'd always gotten really well. She told me about this event called the Work Skills Australia Finals. And what it is, it's like a, a mini Olympics, but it's, it's all the trades and the chefs and the secretaries and the hairdressers. And, you know, it's just a massive, massive event in Australia every year. Um, and I, she wanted to enter me into the regional finals. So I won my regional final and then I won my state final. Um, and what, what, we, what, what I did was I entered into this competition where there were 600 secretaries from across Australia and we went and sat a wee exam and everything. So the first two levels were really good. And then I got selected to go into the national finals. So this is a photo of us at the Port Macquarie Airport. And we were all given our little uniforms and um, Akubra hats. Akubra sponsored us and gave us beautiful Akubra hats and stuff. So, you know, it was an amazing experience. And what happened is they actually flew me all the way over to the other side of Australia in Perth. And um, we competed at the, the Burswood Casino over there and stayed there. And it was all fully sponsored and paid for. And by this stage, I was only 18 years, you know, I'd never been anywhere. I, don't, I couldn't even remember really the last time I'd been on a plane. And um, I ended up coming... I think it was sixth, fifth or sixth in the whole of Australia. So, um, yeah, that was great. And we had lots of photos and trophies and all that. And it was just amazing. And then a full-time position came up at the Tourist Information Centre. And, of course, I applied for it. And I got it straight away because of all this fantastic experience that I'd had. So I'm kind of one of those people that I'm very self-motivated. And I always look out for the next opportunity. And um, I've been very, very lucky that I'm, I'm quite often in the right place at the right time. And um, if something, I don't mind working for free because if I see that it's something that is a, a, an advantage to me, it's going to help my skill set and I get to mix with other people and that's a win-win for me. So that's kind of the philosophy I've kept throughout most of my career, to be honest. Um, and I'll, sh I'll just go through some of these with slides with you. So the national final was fantastic. This is, this is um, a couple of articles and things. So, you know, working at the Tourist Information Centre in the area was really great fun. You know, you're working with lots of fantastic product. You know, you're just talking local tourism. Um, you know, we'd get the, we used to have the Great Lakes Triathlon every year. So I used to volunteer on that. And that was absolutely a massive event. And we'd, the whole town would get overrun with thousands and thousands of tourists every year. It was just a fantastic, you know, first job for me. And I stayed there for a year and a half altogether. As part of that, I, I would go, I had always had a very strong focus on the whole shop local theme um, and supporting local products. So um, as part of that, what we would do is every year we would go to a shopping centre and we would go, it was like called an away promotion. 
and we go away and promote the Great Lakes area, which was beautiful. It's full of lakes and everything. Fantastic tourist spot. So um, he, what I used to do is just go around and get everyone to give me free holidays and then get, go to a shopping centre, you know, miles away and, and give them away. So this is, you know, there's me with my long hair. Um, so, yeah, just a fantastic role and I really, really enjoyed it. And then I found that I really enjoyed working with events. Um, and what I decided to do was to start supporting local charities because I was, you know, becoming, you know, quite a well-known person in the local area. Um, I'd go to different charity events and stuff. And um, this year in particular, we used to have what's called the Oyster Festival. And, um, you know, our area sort of had lots of beautiful fresh seafood and stuff. And um, what happened is um, I ended up coming third that year and they called me the personality princess. <laughs> So, you know, that was fun and I got to meet a few celebrities and I went on live TV for Good Morning Australia and, you know, we, or between all of us, you know, we all had different roles, but we basically held the wig crown or the tiara for a year. We'd go around to all these different events, you know, and just be a local ambassador and this girl here in the middle, Frossa, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, this girl in the middle, she actually won the, the Queen Prize because she raised a, a hell of a lot of money and worked really, really hard. And all of us became really lovely friends. I kind of got fed up with that and I really wanted something different, you know, after a year and a half. You know, I kind of feel like I'd been there, done that, and um, I wanted to move to Sydney. So the second I got there, I started looking through the local paper and, and lo and behold, a job popped up for the Sydney Tourist Board. So I ended up applying for the job and um, I had to travel an hour and a half from my nans to get there of a morning and an hour and a half back of a night time. Um, just, you know, because we were living miles and miles away from the, the main city itself. But I got the job and I was PA to the new marketing director. Um, it's a fellow called Mark Taylor. And he was actually English and he'd never met me before and he came off holiday and here's his little PA sitting there in his office all ready to go. Um, and we were in a very fortunate position because we were working with the MICE market, which is the meetings, incentives, conferences and exhibitions industry. It's a little bit different to what I'd done before. And um, our primary role was to actually bring events into Sydney. So we used to put together bids for major events and one of these that I ended up working on in the time that I spent there um, was actually the bid for the Sydney Olympics, which was really amazing. And the Premier's office, you know, approached our, our, our department and um, asked us to help them bid for this event. Um, all of us were all very heavily involved and my actual job was to find 20,000 hotel rooms for all of the... the um, you know, for basically everyone who comes over with the Olympics if we were successful in winning. So um, I did that job um, probably for a year and a half, just over that. And then I decided I wanted to travel overseas. <laughs> so that was a, an amazing job. Um, it's, out, it's now called Business Events Sydney um, as a very, very, very big deal. Um, but as part of that job, you know, again, it was my role to go out and look at all these different businesses in the city and try and showcase them to people who are coming in from overseas. So I did a lot of tour guiding and stuff through that. And it was an absolutely fascinating industry to be part of. Um, and, you know, we worked very closely with Tourism Australia, who actually had come up with the Crocodile Dundee, you know, G'day Australia campaign. So we worked very closely uh, with them and they were actually a couple of floors below us. Um, but the office that I was in was on the 13th floor of this incredible building and at the view from our balcony was the entire Sydney Harbour. You know, so I've been very, very spoilt, you know, throughout my early career as well as now. So part of that, I did a lot of hostessing of events. So this is me kind of all done up. We had a, a roaring 20s night, fully costumes, we had um, the opera department from the Sydney Opera House bring all these costumes down for us all to wear. And we had them in this massive marquee about out in the middle of the Botanic Gardens. So we just did some incredible, incredible things. 
So, you know, I used to take people out in all sorts of forms of transport. I used to take them sailing. We would go out and, you know, vintage cars. Um, I've climbed the top of the Sydney Har um, Harbour Bridge there. Um, you know, it was, it was really, really beautiful opportunity to see some amazing product and meet some amazing folk from all over the world. Um, used to go in helicopters. Um, here's us flying over the, this is a few years later, but this is us flying over the um, Olympic site. Once we actually ended up, we were successful winning the bid for the Olympics to come to Sydney. So we um, we were hosting these people from the United States and um, we, we flew over the entire Olympic site by helicopter. It was absolutely amazing. It's things like this that I'll absolutely never forget. Here's us in some beautiful vintage cars. You know, we'd often meet them at the airport and do something fun, take them for a lovely drive and check them in at the hotel and the whole idea of all of these events was you know we didn't always tell them what was happening it was whatever they were coming to do it was always a surprise so for example this is the marquee where we are they're on the edge of the the Sydney Harbour and you know we we didn't really tell anyone what we were doing we just piled everyone into limousines drove them up to the top of this beautiful set of stairs at the top of the the, the, the gardens and then they walked down and they found this entire marquee right in front of them um, and the whole night was just a massive success um, I used to come up with some really amazing ideas for events and this one in particular I, I organized 11 of these antique um, Rolls Royces um, and this is us directly in front of the Sydney Opera House and um, I got special permission for us to be able to drive them all up onto the concourse here um, because they usually have check-in desk and you can't get past it. And then this little um, breakfast here in the photos below, we're actually in a little restaurant called the Ben Long Restaurant. And we're actually having breakfast with all the members of the Sydney Chamber Orchestra. And they were, you know, a couple of them were playing in the background. So, you know, I, I found that, you know, it was just such an amazing opportunity to use my creativity um, and showcase something in, a, in, a, in an entirely different way. Um, I used to organise all sorts of things where, you know, we'd show up for a lunch in, in another garden or we'd, we'd catch a ferry to an island and when we got there and we got off the boat, you know, I'd usually have like an Aboriginal playing the didgeridoo or, you know, we'd, and then we'd go to like a buffet and we'd have all sorts of meats like buffalo and kangaroo and all those types of things. So, yeah, it was a really amazing, you know, job. Then in 1991, I decided I wanted to go overseas. I was 21 by then. Um, I wanted to try something different. Um, so what I did is I saved up all the money I could and I quit my job. Um, looking back, I just think, oh, my God. And um, I left Australia and I only had $3,000 and a one-way ticket. <laughs> so I decided to head off to Spain. So I kind of came over here um, to Britain for the very first time. Um, I was very lucky because my dad's English. So I discovered that I could get a British passport and work over here and never have to worry ever again. And back in those days, I could also work within any AEC country. Um, so I decided that, uh, you know, once I'd kind of done a little bit of touring around Britain, that I wanted to go out to Spain to work on the World Expo. So... This was in 1992 by then, and it was actually in Seville. So I went out and I got um, a flat share with a wee Spanish girl in the centre of town. And I just kept, um, the expo was actually being built at this stage. And what it is, it's a world expo for every single country in the world. So um, each one of them would give, be given a space where they could build an exhibition that promoted their country. And I mean, the Saudi Arabian one was absolutely stunning. It was just beautiful. And it was all set up like Mecca with all these, oh, it was just amazing. All these prayer stations and just absolutely beautiful. And then the Americas had this huge, you know, like, you know, football and pom-poms and all these big stage shows. And then, you know, you had your Fiji um, Expo and um, they had all these burets built and you had, you know, Fijians running around in loincloths and stuff. So, um I kind of um, was determined to get a job there and um, they had this amazing Australian pub 
the kangaroo pub, they called it, and I kept um, bugging them for a job for about two or three weeks. I used to go in every day and keep handing my CV in. Um, but I ended up at the end, I got a job in the British Pavilion, which was absolutely stunning. And if you look back, I mean, the, they, they built this entire thing and it had a waterfall fall right down the front of it. And, and this water would just drip down the glass the entire day long. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I ended up working in the restaurant there just as a bus girl and getting paid in, you know, pesetas. And, you know, it was just really fun. And I stayed there for the whole six months. But then, you know, when towards the end of that, um, you know, and you find that when you work on an event for that long and it's suddenly all of a sudden it's, it's finishing up, you just don't know what to do with yourself. So, you know, I was kind of really tossing up, you know, I'd been away for a year by this stage and I didn't know whether to go home or not. So I decided to go back to London and I stayed there for a year, worked in pubs and stuff. And then I decided I finally had had enough because I was so homesick and I went back home to Australia. So, you know, I'd been away two years by then and settling back in was really, really difficult. Um, you know, I just felt like a fish out of water and it took me quite a, quite a while to find my feet again. Um, but luckily a fantastic job came up and it was with Fatalele Island Resort. And I kept saying to my friends, oh, I think something amazing is about to happen. I can just feel it. And sure enough, I got sent for this interview and they needed a reservations manager for this resort in Fiji, but I would be working in the head office in Sydney with directly with the guy who owned the place. So I went and met him and he, you know, he's really interesting. Two days later, they flew me off to Fiji because I got the job. And I went over there on um, like, an in, um, like an introduction and they sent me for eight days. <laughs> so I'd started this amazing job. I hadn't even been, been paid a penny yet. And, you know, they sent me into this amazing resort and basically it was like 12 berets or these stunning luxury villas. And they usually charge about $1,000 for two people per night. So suddenly I found myself sitting on this abandoned beach, you know, in the middle of Fiji um, on this deserted island, um, miles from the mainland. And um, it was just really, really quiet. And they kind of left you to your own devices all the time. But what I did is I really threw myself into getting to know the local area. And I went, um, used to have these amazing day trips. So the two that were the most incredible was um, we went into the local village where a lot of the locals, you know, we a lot of the workers for the resort they were from this local village they used to only get a dollar an hour in wages you know it was absolutely crazy so um what they do is they take the little bus into the the resort center and they you go into the village and you sit down in the church hall and you know they've got all these things out for sale like bead necklaces and stuff so absolutely lovely and um but I didn't really want to do all the touristy things. So I kind of wandered off through the village and I ended up sitting in one of the wee homes with one of the locals. Um, and all they had for homes were literally corrugated iron huts. And I ended up sitting on the floor on these grass mats that they had where they used to sleep and cook and do everything. Um, and surrounded by all these little villages and they, all they had for, um, for their cooking facilities were basically was a, a log fire and, and hot stones. So yeah, I had a cup of tea with them and then headed back to the resort, you know, and it was an amazing, amazing experience. So I was really lucky and I worked there for um, four years in the head office. Um, we had quite a lot of celebrities that used to go to this resort, particularly from Australia. And um, it was regularly featured as one of the top 10 resorts in the entire world. Um, it was really very, very exclusive. And I mean, this is a little lift out that was done in the Vogue entertaining feature. Um, and, you know, they had all these, the water was absolutely stunning. They had all these stunning photos, you know, it was just an amazing experience. And if you've ever been to Fiji, I mean, it's exactly like the brochure, you know, the whitest sand in the world, the most perfect shells, the peace and the calm is just incredible. Um, you know, lying in a hammock, you know, it's an absolute dream and the sunsets are just totally to die for, you know, so I worked for that company for four years. Um, 
the most famous um, person I ever had that I booked into the island was actually um, George Harrison from the Beatles. And um, on the day that his agent actually rang me, he said, um, I'm going to book George into the resort with his wife, but you're not allowed to tell anybody. And I was like, okay, I can do that. So, of course, the managing director comes in and it's his resort. And he's like, I said, oh, I've got a VIP flying into Nandy Airport. And I said, I need one of our staff members to meet him there and get him straight onto a helicopter to the island. And I said, but I'm not allowed to tell you who it is. <laughs> so, you know, true to my word, I just, I honestly, I didn't tell a single soul. And um, George Harrison and his wife, sure enough, landed at Nandy Airport. No one knew he was coming. No one knew who he was. Um, the girl from my Nandy office went and met him, got him straight onto the helicopter and he flew off to the island. He stayed there for 10 days. Um, and it had an absolute amazing time. And what you find is, you know, these people, okay, they have a lot of celebrity status and, you know, maybe a lot of money, but at the end of the day, all they want to do is go somewhere private and just be treated the same as anyone else and just enjoy their holiday and kick back and, and relax. And that's exactly what happened. So I was just absolutely delighted with that one. So after I, um, you know, I'd been there for four years, I decided to try something new because there are what you find in Australia is you don't tend to get a job for life. You, you do hop around a lot over there um, purely to get the experience because you're always looking for something new. So I ended up going working for this company called Bill Peach Journeys. Um, and they had two private airplanes that used to fly all over Australia. So um, we would get people paying oh, about between seven and $10,000 per trip. Um, and they would go off for maybe four or five days at a time. And we'd be, we'd, we'd, the plane would be taking them to areas like, you know, um, Ayers Rock and, you know, the back of, you know, um, the Warren Bungles and just all over the, all these amazing unique experiences. And they would drop into, you know, really small airports, middle of nowhere and take them off to wineries and things. So I found that absolutely fantastic. It was my job to put all the programs together, you know, book everything, all the hotels and stuff. And I found it really interesting because, um, as much as it sounds incredibly gl glamorous, we used to be based at the Sydney airport. And we were directly next to the jet hangar. And we were lit, our office was literally in a demountable building. So if you ever know what those are like, they're actually like makeshift metal huts. And when the aircrafts used to start up their engines directly next to us, you couldn't hear an abs, you know, you couldn't hear a thing. Um, but I used to get to go airside as part of that job. So I had to go right through airport security and get my accreditation and my badge so that I could go in behind where all the helicopters and stuff were parked. And I used to go onto the aircrafts, the aircrafts and actually prepare them for takeoff. So, um, but, you know, I would be going in and getting, uh, you know, like the, the little trolleys and stuff like the drink trolleys and all that filled up, you know, and I'd get totally covered in dust because I'd have to go into the shed and pull all the drinks out of the cut, the cases and pack it all up and then put all the brochures in all the seats. And, you know, it was really, really fascinating. And then I would, you know, sit down with the pilots and prepare them for their trips and, you know, discuss, make sure that all their air slots were um, in order for all the airports as they were flying around the country. So I totally loved all that. Um, and so what, eventually I kind of left that job and I ended up going to real estate for a couple of years. Um, and then I met my husband and got married um, after only five months of knowing him. And we decided to move to back to Foster, my hometown, because my mum had gotten cancer at that stage. Um, and I wanted to kind of live near her for the year and just make sure that she's okay while she was going through her surgery and mastectomies and things. So what I did is um, I decided to set up my own wee business. Um, and part of that was actually working with the local chamber of commerce. And I called it Great Lakes Events and Admin. You know, um, I kind of came in with lots of big ideas. I looked at the area and I thought that there was a lot of opportunity to um, bring the mice market into that area and maybe bring conferences and things into town. 
Um, so I volunteered as chairman to sit on the local cultural center committee um, because we were, you know, looking for developers who would actually build a project project. And I was, you know, going around lobbying for money and stuff to get the center built. So after a year, um, you know, my mom was much better and I, me and my, my husband decided to move again. Um, so we bought a caravan and we went down to Melbourne and um, there we ended up going back to Sydney. But for the time that I was there, I kept myself really, really busy and I ended up doing this amazing event called the Outdoor Show. And it basically it was a two-day show um, which was in a caravan park. And it was actually like a massive exhibition with all sorts of things and market stalls and stuff. And I brought in, you know, musicians from all over and we, you know, it was a really amazing event. And I did that to raise funds for the local radio station. Um, but what was really interesting, we had helicopter rides as part of that because we had a little beach off to the side. And then I also had like um, a, a, a caravan of camels. <laughs> they came and set up in the back and they were doing camel rides and stuff so you know I really enjoyed that that was great fun and I didn't get paid an awful lot of money but I just you know came up with the whole concept did all the photography and you know we had a live radio broadcast from the location the entire weekend and all these beautiful you know like German hot dog stalls and fantastic food and we had a celebrity chef which was absolutely amazing so you know loads of press and PR and publicity and that was all fabulous and then I eventually decided um, that my husband and I weren't very compatible so after seven years um, we'd bought three houses um, so what we did is we decided to sell up everything and move to Scotland because he was from here and he needed to come home. And I didn't fancy um, be, being a single mum back in Australia on my own without him. So we packed up the wee kitties and moved to Scotland and I ended up moving out on my own. But for the first five years, I mean, it was really, really daunting and very, very hard for me because, you know, I'd left all my friends and family in Australia and, you know, I kind of, there were many times there where I maybe regretted my decision. I felt really lonely and, um, you know, I found it really hard to make friends, to be honest. Um, so eventually I decided I'd, I'd start working once the kids were up at an age where they could start going to school. But my youngest daughter had had head surgery before we left. Um, she had a condition that's called craniosynostosis where the, the, the bones in your skull fused too early. So when she was only 10 months old, she had major head surgery and plastic surgery um, on her entire head and her face. Um, so for that reason, I, I stopped going out altogether because she didn't have you know, the top of her skull was not there for, for a couple of years. So I couldn't take her to play centers and things. And when, she, when we, when that first happened, she used to have to wear a helmet and things. Um, and I was really very fearful of taking her anywhere after that. So I really did sit at home with her for a very long time. But, you know, obviously I couldn't do that forever. And eventually, you know, I kind of got myself together and I, I went back to work and started studying and doing part-time things in Australia. And once the kids were kind of going to preschool and they were in primary, then it gave me some free time to do all these other things for myself. So I've had quite a few jobs over the years here since I started in Scotland and I've had a few, I've had a few stops and starts because the, the biggest problem as a single mum is your childcare situation. So, you know, you could, and, and what I often found is I'd end up on zero hour contracts, you know, so it's really hard to go and get someone to pay childcare, especially during the school holidays, where you could be up for 240 pounds a week just to cover her. Um, and you might only be making 150 that week. So I, I had to juggle things like that for a really, really long time going and, and, um, you know, I worked part-time at the Kamani Football Club, as you see here in this photo. That was an amazing job to be part of. Um, I totally loved it completely. And I was really upset when I eventually left. Um, then I went on to a company called RE Energy and they actually headhunted me and um, they needed an office manager. 
So that, I found that really interesting to be in there and, and working with, you know, solar panels and all that stuff and watching what, what happened behind the scenes. And I actually learned quite a lot from that, from that role. And that's when I first fell into the whole social media thing. And I started doing, you know, their Twitter and all their editorial and their advertising and their Facebook and everything else. And I actually found that I really, really enjoyed doing all of that. And I decided that that's what I wanted to specialize in. So that company only lasted a couple of years. And um, fortunately, they eventually closed it down um, and I lost my job. And I was back on the kind of, you know, on the job hunt again. And this is 2016. So I decided to go out on my own and I thought, you know, I was really tired of working for other people that had the final say on how things were advertised. And I thought that I could do things a lot better than maybe they could. Um, so I decided to start my own business and I went off to the job center and I, prized, uh, I applied for the new enterprise allowance. Um, and what that did is it gave me 66 pounds a week for 13 weeks and then for the next 13 weeks after that, I got 33 pounds a week. So what that did is I didn't have to stay then on unemployment benefits. I was actually able to go self-employed, which was, you know, fantastic for the, for the morale. Um, you know, it gave me a lot of confidence. I was able to do something creative. So what I did is I started everything from scratch. <coughs> And um, as you can see here, I created my own logo, my own business. And for the very first time, I was absolutely 100% in control of everything. So this is the logo that I designed. And my daughter and I sat down and created this between us. And I think she was only about 12 at the time. And Spin, you know, basically we wanted, it's, it stands for Strategic Public Relations Information Network, which is a really big mouthful. But, you know, it's been handy. And the whole idea behind Spin is that, you know, I was really good at creating an image for a company and creating the story that went behind that. So basically, I've been running that business for five years in the background. Um, and I never went into that to make money. I actually went into it because I loved what I was doing. And instead of, <coughs> instead of going around and advertising for clients, what I would do is actually approach charities and offer to do their marketing and things for them. And that worked really, really well. So I'm going to get a little drink of water here. So what I found is that was really successful and I've worked with some amazing clients now. So the clients have included things like Live at Troon, Celebrate Kamarnik, the New Mills Food Festival, and I've worked with some incredible celebrities throughout the time I've been running that. I all started, also started the Kamarnik Supper Club because, you know, obviously I didn't have a lot, <coughs> I didn't have a lot of friends here. Um, and I found this was an amazing way to meet the over 40s. And we bring in people that really didn't know anyone or in the same position as me and that's actually been su extremely successful and I've got some really lovely friends as a result of that experience um, and that's still running today and the last event we had just before lockdown last year we had about 12 people at the dinner and we use a different restaurant each time we always get strangers joining the group that you know have are coming along for the first time so it's just a really really lovely environment and it's actually based on an idea that works really well back in Australia. And it's really just a social club for people that maybe, you know, find themselves divorced <coughs> or they're empty nesters. Um, so, yeah, that's been really nice. So that's been a, a really interesting project. And, I mean, as of yesterday, the page views on this blog in particular have been, you know, 7,500 over the past four years. So what, I was, what I'll do is I go along to restaurants and I also do reviews on them and I take photographs and then I upload all of that to TripAdvisor. So I'm now a level 12 restaurant um, reviewer on TripAdvisor, just one of my many kind of strings to the bow. My full-time day job is with Burns Mall Kamarnik and I started with them three years ago. 
was my role to take on the marketing and events in the centre and, and bring some atmosphere into the, the town. So what I did is I started a thing called Music in the Mall where I used to bring buskers in every Saturday for a couple of hours. So I've created a lot of press around this and I've now I've got a group of, of local buskers that um, I think there's about 150 people in the group. So what happens now is if I get involved in any festival or events, I go out to that entire group and ask who wants to play on the day. So it's a really easy way to kind of get, you know, entertainment um, and they just jump at the opportunity. It's amazing. So I've been able to bring them into a few things like Live at Troon and the New Meals Food Festival. I created this little logo because that's one of the fun things that I enjoy doing. Um, here's one of the, yeah, this is one of my lovely little girls. She's an absolutely adorable Holly. Um, you know, we we tend to, what we do is we, we do the events as a live stream and it runs for approximately an hour and a half. And then we run that on Facebook. And what happens is I usually get between four and 10,000 views on each live stream video. So it's an absolutely massive audience for one little busker sitting in a town centre shopping centre in the middle of Kamarnik. You know, we do really, really well. I also teamed up with the KA Radio. So they also, you know, put those videos and things on their page. And they've got, I think, about 7,000 followers. So all these kids have just been absolutely amazing. It's been a real pleasure to get to know them. Um, part of my job at Burns Mall is obviously working with, you know, um, we hold art exhibitions, you know, we did a pub double page spread for this one, we had centre stage in, they brought people in doing tap dancing on the floor and all sorts of really amazing things. I think he was doing um, flips at one stage, which you should never do wearing tap shoes on a marble floor. But anyway, yeah, so that was really excellent. And yeah. Um, since the COVID, we've basically had to stop all of these events. Um, we've also had, you know, some, some semi-famous people in. We had um, Care James in last year, and he was one of the, content one of the contestants on um, Britain's Got Talent. I think he made it through to the final or the semi-final. We've had the William Hill Cup tour. That's me and my boss standing with the trophy, being gorgeous. Um, every year we have all these Christmas events. What I like to do is raise money for the local food bank. So we always have a Santa and every Saturday we bring in a local um, charity to come and fundraise and they can put out their wee buckets and things. Um, and we do lots of lovely stuff with the local churches and, you know, the Salvation Army. And um, what I do is reach out to all the local community groups anyone that kind of needs a free stall for a day, they're welcome to come into the centre and set up their, po their pop-up posters and things and promote their charity or whatever. Then as part of my role, what I decided to do um, in 2019, I set up a Love Kamarnik Shop local campaign. Um, we had 28 local shops in this campaign. It was the first time I'd done anything like that for 30 years. And uh, it worked really well. So basically I came up with the entire concept. Um, we hadn't had anything like that in the town centre for quite a while. So that's kind of one of the things I specialise in is actually promoting shops. So I do quite a lot of photography as part of that. And so what this involved is I went around, did a photo shoot, a photo shoot at each of the, the 28 shops. And it took me three weeks altogether. It was an absolutely massive job. Um, we created the posters, I did all the advertising, I created the entry forms, um, I went and got all the prizes and then I got a whole heap of sponsors to get involved with that. So these, this is a photo of all the sponsors that were involved, that includes Celebrate Kamarnik, we've got a couple of the local councillors here, the Provost, and then you've got Tracy Money from the Town Centre Regeneration Team. And that's us drawing the, the major prize, which was £250 worth of local shopping vouchers. You know, so I found that really, really interesting. Um, off the back of that, we ran a shop local campaign, which was called the Festive Shopping Spree. And in that, we featured the 12 shops of Christmas. So again, I did another 12 photo shoots. Um, and I actually found that working with the shops is really, really interesting because you get to photograph some amazing products. Under Spin Admin, I decided to offer assistance to the Love Kamanic group, um, sorry, and the Love New Milns group. Um, 
they run the New Melons Food Fest every year. And it's basically the biggest festival in the whole of Ayrshire um, for food and drink. Um, so this was back in 2018. I joined the committee and partly because of the experience I'd had having a celebrity chef involved, I decided, well, I suggested to them that we use Gary McLean, who was the first national chef of Scotland and getting quite a lot of press that year. And unbelievably, we managed to get him for the event. So bringing in a celebrity chef into a two day festival like that actually paid off enormously because we had absolutely masses of press. We had loads of people there that year. Um, I think there was about 1,500 on the Saturday alone. Um, here's some articles. Um, he did an absolutely amazing job and he was also just about to um, release his, his own, his first recipe book. So we used that as a part of the promotion on that weekend. Um, and, you know, Gary was a former Master Chef winner. And then we just had this amazing, you know, press um, in the local papers. We had this big double page spread in the Kamalik Standard. All of the councillors were there. I got to work with Gary on the entire day. So I was filming him and taking photos. And it was my job to kind of take him around and introduce him to all the VIPs. I also had to um, take him to meet the journalists on the day who showed up to take photos. Um, and as a result, um, he did a an interview with Sergio Burns from Ash magazine and he ended up getting a double page spread. So this is him with the provost and the, and the deputy provost of East Ayrshire. And this is the double page spread that we got in the Ayrshire magazine as a result of that. So these are the kind of things that I tend to specialize in. And then the following year, um, we wanted to change it up a bit. So we actually managed to get Tony Singh this thing's going a bit slow. So Tony jumped at the chance. Um, he was absolutely amazing. Another master chef winner. Um, he was absolutely fantastic. Um, he is a Singh, so he is from an Indian heritage and he's the, the fellow that wears the wee kilt while he's cooking. Um, he has been on masses and masses of shows, including BBC and all sorts of things. Um, yeah, and absolutely, absolute gentleman I mean he is incredible to work with he's super motivated on his social media and this was his idea to take this wee selfie on the day um you know and again I looked after him I filmed him the whole day I trailed him around um and I ran the entire marketing campaign that year and as a result of bringing Tony in and then myself working on that we actually had an extra thousand people that year to the festival so I was absolutely delighted with the results of that. And that's actually, that is the absolute biggest, you know, project that I have ever worked on in my life. The social media alone was enormous. Um, I worked with about 200 exhibitors and I had to get each of them advertised on the festival, you know, um, marketing for that event in all the weeks leading up to it, did all the wee videos and absolutely everything. So, you know, we've had some fantastic articles you know, fantastic press, another double page in the Asia magazine, absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, so I, as an extra bonus, I actually got all of my own photographs on a double page as well that year. So, you know, just absolutely delighted with the exception of this big group shot here because I'm actually in it. So um, in summary, really, I... You know, I, I love photography. I love it. I love working with anything that has, you know, kind of an interesting element to it. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, like an accountant or, um, you know, like a florist shop or a radio station or, you know, basically anyone that has a business. I really enjoy working with them. And what I find is, what I have found over the years is that I really enjoy taking photographs of people going about their everyday lives. And one of the focuses that I have is on actually showcasing a business and showcasing the staff who work in and on that business, because I think that's just so important, important. So I never used to take photos of people up until about two or three years ago, but, um, this particular photograph, these are girls that were actually working in the local new look in Kamarnak. So they're all staff members. 
and you know I, I kind of approached the shop and I went look I'd really like to do a new look photo shoot um can I you know let's get it, these girls out and we'll put some clothes on them so we actually took them over to Cape Park and the results were absolutely beautiful you know and they're just the prettiest young girls <coughs> and just absolutely stunning wee outfits so it's just a new way of showing things to the local Kamanic area since then I've done stuff for JD Sports um, Pep and Co Tesco and then I've also started for an entire year I supported the Hansel charity and these are some photos from their um, races day so this girl in particular is one of the guests absolutely stunning outfit from Bobo boutique in air um, this is a photo shoot that I did with rule 42 this young girl is a radio journalist, um, DJ. She's never done modeling before, but yeah, as you can see, she's absolutely stunning in this wee outfit. So I just took her down the back streets in, in Kamarnik around the Bank Street area, which is really lovely and historic. And she just looks absolutely magic. And they've got these stunning ball gowns and really, really, it just went off so well. Um, a lot of these photo shoots I do for free. Um, this is a, a really good pal of mine, Lorna Reed. Absolutely stunning in some stuff from New Look. Um, she looked absolutely gorgeous. And then one of my highlights of that year in 2019 was actually working with Graham Clark. We went down to the Burns Museum. So this is Graham and his pals doing a little concert that night. Um, I worked with them taking photos of all the meet and greets, all the VIPs that came in. Um, and these are just some other random shots, um, like from the author's event for Hansel. I've worked on the ladies' day lunches and then the ball, was, which was an absolute highlight of the calendar that year. Um, absolutely stunning. I mean, the, the whole venue, we were down at the Brigadoon. It was just absolutely beautiful. Um, so I've just, you know, I, I feel very privileged to have been involved with so many incredible, you know, businesses around town um this is a florist photo shoot that i did absolutely beautiful um and i'm just one of those point and point and shoot photographers i don't really plan anything that i'm doing you know but just i really love what i do i do it for the um the enjoyment you know rather than than worrying about getting paid at the end of the day because you know I've been really lucky in my life. I've got, I've managed to keep a full-time job during COVID and, you know, that's the end of my presentation. So I hope you find that interesting. Um, I just kind of wanted to do something a bit different and just give you more of an overview about who I am because there's not a lot of people in the group that actually knew me before ABW and I, do, I tend to stick behind the scenes rather than getting out there in the open and in front of folk. Did you have any questions at all? <laughs> I think your career has been fascinating, Tamara. It's amazing yeah. how many different things that you've done and experienced and seen as well. You know, it's not until you actually sit down and look at it all. And I mean, you're talking, I mean, I first started when I was 17, 18. So you're talking 33 years of, you know, life experiences. And um, I just think I'm, I've been a lot, a lot luckier than most and I, I think because of what I've been through with my daughter and then having cancer last year I kind of look at life a little bit differently you know and I realize how precious it is um so you know if if hardship kind of comes my way I mean I just deal with it on the spot and then move on again because you know things always brighten up and you know this year I was just really lucky to get the opportunity to become president of ABW, you know, and that gave me something to, to get over my cancer and, you know, something to take my mind off what I've been through during COVID. And, you know, so I just kind of embrace all those opportunities and, you know, I just can't wait to get out and start photographing new stuff again and, you know, meeting all the new girls that have joined the group and seeing it. I mean, I was thinking the other day, I've never even met any of you in person. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I just, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. You know, it's just, I can't believe we haven't met in person. You know, but yeah. So, yeah, it's been a great life. You know, and my, and my kids, but my kids think I'm really boring. So there you go. <laughs> uh, 
but I don't mind, you know. So it's, I think it's good to look back and see all these things on paper, though, and to keep the records and maybe one day I'll just leave all of this behind and then they'll kind of go, oh, you know, maybe mum wasn't so boring after all. Uh, yeah. Hey, yeah, really interesting. Really interesting. So, sorry, what was that? Really interesting, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know yourself, Gail, it's like when you have problems with your baby as well. You know, and yeah, absolutely. It, it just knocks you for six, and you know everything else kind of goes by the wayside. Yep. You know, yep. And, and nothing else matters. You no, know? And, and obviously you had a difficult year last year, and these oh, things kind of yeah, yeah, and remind it you of what life's about rather than yeah, just it really work does. And whatever. Yeah, it, yeah, it really does. You know, I've got a bucket list of things that I want to do here in Scotland now. Um, you know, for a long time there. I mean, I had no money at all to do anything. You know, I would be lucky if I had 10 pounds left at the end of every week, you know, yeah. and um, I'm kind of lucky now. I'm in a bit more of a fortunate position and about to buy my first house here. So, and it's been 15 years coming and I've lived in about eight different houses just renting all those years since I got divorced. Yeah, but you yeah, know... No, it's good. Yeah. It's good yeah. what you've done. Yeah. So, no, I just, I just hope that, you know, for future, my girls will occasionally listen to me and maybe get some of the same opportunities that I had. Yeah. It's definitely my hope for the future. So, thank you very much for listening to me. Appreciate it. And thank you oh, for thank coming. You. Yeah. Thank you. So did you. Did you have any questions before we finished up today? No, I'm all right. Okay. Well, thank you, girls. I hope you have a lovely weekend and I'll look forward to seeing you very soon. Thanks, Tamara. Thanks, Tamara. Bye. 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 Bye.